welcome everybody. It is it's always nice to be back with Murdoch friends. So, what's in the mix for Murdoch Mixology? First up, our speaker series. And I think that Patricia has really picked a brilliant theme for this year. It's art gardens. So it's gardens for art, art in gardens. And this is something really new for us. We haven't ever done a topic like this. So it's fresh, it's original, and very relevant to Wichita Art Museum. But I'm gonna let Patricia expand on that. What else is in the mix? Well, we have our spring party. We've chosen a date. It's June 10th. We're gonna have a rain date, June 11th. You never know. Um, we're going to visit three houses, and each one of these houses is headed by a collector who does not let space limit their passion. All three of them take a very different approach to collecting, and each one, I think, is oh so worth the visit. Actually, I think our hosts are here tonight, so I'm just gonna tell you who they are. It's Charlie Baker, Richard Overby, and Matt Buckingham, and Trish Higgins. <coughs> so look for your invitation, and um, you know, Space is going to be limited, so I would say when you get it, if you're interested, you ought to sign up quickly. I think it's time to get our evening started, so I'm going to turn it over now to Patricia, and I think she's got some interesting things to say. Gosh, it's, it's such a liability to follow Tony at, at anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> The husband says, tell me about it. Um, what a wonderful start to an absolutely spectacular year. And of course, I want to uh, welcome all of you to really a kickoff for a series of both conversations um, and presentations. And I don't know about the rest of you, I love our new nomenclature name, whatever we're calling this, Murdoch Mixology. Of course, that came out of the brain of the spectacular Bud Gates. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's, it's got that sort of a little bit of a alcohol reference. <laughs> We're mixing it up. It's going to be fun. We do different things at any rate. Um, and it, um, I, you know, very honestly, when, when we have um, a year of patron gatherings and we're looking for a thread of the conversations that we will have, it's a tough job to come up with that um, every year. And I struggle. And it was as I was in the car to go to a meeting with Tony to figure this out that it just kind of entered my brain, that we have a project across actually the next two years, but you know, launching now, to create our own new art garden. We have a, a building, a facility that is architecturally impressive. Our surroundings, less so. We'll just leave it at that. Um, and that's all about to change very dramatically thanks to um, the prescience and generosity of uh, private support locally. We are still negotiating with our selected design firm, so I'm not really going to let that cat out of the bag um, this evening quite yet, but I uh, do want to let you know that um, I and the people who are on our Art Guardian Committee who um, made the selection are just tremendously excited about this team that we're going to be working with and the potential. So um, I promise to keep you very much in, in the loop um, and just to say that we are at such an exciting sort of almost launch point um, for this. Um, and, and so it seemed to me if this was something that we were going to be taking on across this year um, and the art garden, we will, you know, you are all, I'm giving you the notice already, it's October 2015, so not this fall, but next fall, and you need to be at that event. Um, if, if this is a project that we have embarked on, what can we learn from those projects across the country at other art museums that have done 
something similar. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no at our scale, but you know, they've gone through a similar kind of process. And one of the immediate easy choices was the Papa John Sculpture Park at the Des Moines Art Center, you know, right in our backyard. Um, so the speaker this evening is very impressive, um, Director Jeff Fleming, um, and we're thrilled to have him here. But before I introduce him, I really want to also acknowledge that we're at that point in the year at the Wichita Art Museum where we in the trenches on the staff have buckled our seatbelt. Um, next week, actually starting tomorrow, is spring break, and we have a whole new level of programming. You're about to see some advertising uh, for that, but um, we have what we've called artcation. Well, we've heard of vacations and we've heard of staycations when the recession hit. Well, if you're in town with your kids and they're out of school and you're looking for something to do, come to the art museum. Um, we have a special through the week where if you are 17 and under, admission is only a dollar. And we're going to have live music at 11. We have a theater group who's performing. Um, we have movies through the day. Of course, we always have art making in the studio. We have what they're calling micro tours. We're just going to have all sorts of fun. And it's inspired by many different things. I loved it last year my first year through spring break as the art museum director, all of a sudden the decibel level in the building just went up like this. <laughs> oh my god, they're kids! Um, so we're, we're capitalizing on that. The Friends of the Wichita Art Museum are having their art on a mon Monday um, on March 24th. We're doing a cool kind of cabaret uh, program called Meat Hook on March 27th with um, an um, alternative folk duo called Truck Stop Honeymoon, and we're serving, and this is um, in conjunction with our uh, George Catlin Buffalo exhibition, so you can come and you can imbibe uh, a beer called Buffalo Sweat. <clears throat> Love to have you all here that evening. Um, of course, we have our beloved next Wichita Art Chatter again, and that's April 18th, and we're, we're partnering with the Wichita Jazz Festival this year. They're doing a performance here on April 24th. So you see, we're just, we're just strapped in for all sorts of activity of, and fun. But I, I cite these activities because all of you in the room appreciate their vital importance. I've been telling Jeff today that here in Wichita, you know, I just adore uh, the Wichita patrons of the arts and the Wichita Art Museum because you just get it. You, you really understand that, yes, you're a member of the Murdoch Society because you, will lo you love the camaraderie and the, and the learning that we share, but a a another important aspect of this for all of you is that you care deeply about the quality of life in Wichita. And, and you're willing to become a member at this patron level to make that happen. So I thank you very deeply for being on this adventure with us and helping to make this happen for our city. Uh, Jeff Fleming has really been on the go um, in Des Moines. He, um, you know, there's just countless things that I could tell you um, that he has achieved there for his uh, museum. He's a 16-year veteran now of the Des Moines Art Center. One of the things, you know, when I, whenever I'm introducing someone, I sort of look to see, you know, what's going on across their life. And one of the things that I always um, kind of key on, if I can uh, figure this out, is that first job that you have, and do I have a resume that gives me that information? This is a man who got his first foot in a ladder in uh, the cultural arts. He was a clerical assistant at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. So that might be fodder for interesting conversation with him um, over dinner. He's a museum person who trained as a visual artist. He has a BFA and an MFA, so across his career he's focused on modern and contemporary art, and he worked for 16 years at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We learn that he is a uh, native uh, of that state, and across that 16 years, you know, he probably started as the bottle washer and ended up being chief curator across uh, that time. And then he moved to uh, Des Moines um, 
And as I said, it's been there for 16 years. The, um, the person who was director left and they said, great, we've, we've got the next good person right here. So he, they kept him as director in 2005. And he's done a range of all sorts of interesting um, exhibitions um, and publications. He's worked with Maya Lin, and I was lovely to see, appreciated to see Fred Wilson. He worked with Andy Goldsworthy, a number of you in the audience um, remember Goldsworthy, who uh, has the work at WSU and probably met him. And then just a range of different kind of um, exhibitions that are thematic exhibitions. So contemporary art and the, the culture of Japanese animation. Aisle Five, he's gonna have to explain that title later, but that was a show about artists who use a common found materials in their sculpture and in their installation works. And then uh, minimalist aesthetic that would include artists like, or did include artists like Ellsworth Kelly, Solowit, Robert Irwin, and, and others. Um, sort of on the, on the um, operations side of, of things, he recently completed a $34 million capital campaign that was for, and you know, kind of the hard, the hard, the really difficult uh, money to raise in any kind of community. Endowment, general operating funds, and for um, an infrastructure expansion of their storage facility. Not many people like putting their name on, you know, art storage. <laughs> So, you know, but look, you know, Je you know, he must have a magic wand somewhere um, in his back pocket. And in 2009, he completed the uh, John and Mary Papa John Sculpture Park that's actually in downtown Des Moines, he will tell you. And he was a partner with both the donors um, and the city of Des Moines as that happened. And that's what we have invited him here to talk about. So please help me to welcome Jeff to Wichita and, and also to the podium. Thank you, thank you. It's very good to be here. And, and I must say, I think this is the first time that my audience has been able to drink during one of my talks. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's gonna really help you a lot because it'll make me, it'll make me sound a lot better. Um, so I'm very glad to be here, and I'm glad uh, also to meet um, seemingly old friends. So um, I'm, I'm pleasant, uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great pleasure to hear your plans for your art garden and what the future may hold here, and that's very exciting. What I thought I would do is to give you a background of the Des Moines Arts Center. Hopefully some of you have been there. If not, I encourage you to come. Uh, I'll give you a history of the Art Center and the sculpture on the grounds and then some sculpture already in the Des Moines area, the development of the sculpture park, and then what that might have been the catalyst for, uh, for what is happening in Des Moines today. So we are now celebrating our 66th year as an institution. We did come out of the Des Moines Fine Arts Association, was, which was a, a smaller organization and James Edmondson, who died in the 1930s, left money to that organization to build a museum and to create uh, a new uh, museum. And he was very wise, having passed away in the midst of the Great Depression. He said that the organization could not spend his bequest until 10 years <coughs> hence. Uh, at that time, we were out of the Depression, and that money was much more valuable than it would have been in the 1930s. Um, hopefully we are acclaimed as one of the best modern and contemporary museums in the country. We have a, a relatively small budget, five million dollars. Uh, we have uh, uh, 130 part-time and full-time employees, about 50 to 60 full-time employees. We have 5,000 works in the collection, which is really, um, in the scheme of things, not a, a, a huge collection, but remember this is a very focused collection and thus we have uh, hopefully developed a niche where we can focus our energies and our resources in creating that. Our facility itself is comprised of three buildings, actually four now, there's an underground building. The public buildings, the first was built in 1948 by Ilio Saarinen, the second, 1968, by Richard Meyer, excuse me, by I.M. Pei, and the third in 1985 by Richard Meyer. So every 20 years or so, we decide to build something new. And in fact, the Sculpture Park was the, 
the most recent something new in, in addition to the underground storage. Uh, as we've uh, discussed, we opened in 1929. We opened with 25 works, and we'll get to all of this. And we've added uh, three works since we've opened it. We have about 200,000 visitors a year. We present about 12 exhibitions a year, uh, focusing many times on the first museum exhibition by an international artist in a U.S. museum. Uh, that is a niche we haven't set out to accomplish, but it seems to be something that seems to be recurring. Uh, numerous education and an outreach program. Something I'm very proud of is, is a, a membership affiliate organization called Art Noir, and it focuses on young professionals, perhaps in their mid-20s to their mid 30s and we now have over 450 members of this young professionals group. Uh, I don't know if there's a similar type of organization here, uh, but it has become the second largest young professional group in the city of Des Moines, only after YPC with this young professional collection, which is part of the partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. And their organization is shrinking and our organization is growing up. So we're very excited about that because we do want to be an active participant in the social fabric of the community and we feel like developing audiences young, either through children or families with children or through young adults will be a strategic plan for the future. You're developing those participants, you're developing that interested body of work, and hopefully in the future, uh, obviously, you're developing patrons and donors as well. And we do believe very firmly that we add to the vibrancy of the city of Des Moines and the state of Iowa, uh, both socially, educationally, culturally, and certainly economically. So, and the sculpture park is a part of that discussion, which we'll get to as well. So let me just show you some images. The first building, again, built in 1948, Ilio Serenin, and this was the first museum built in the United States after World War II, and it was very much a modernist building, just as Frank Lloyd Wright in the prairie landscape where the architecture hugged the uh, the, the landscape and it was a low-rise building and it was a very conscious attempt at that time not to build this grand temple on, the, on the, the hill so to speak but to be of the moment and a participant in the moment and hopefully we've continued uh, with that philosophy in our collecting in our architecture with I.M. Pei and then in everything that we do. This was I.M. Pei's first building, or at least one of his first buildings, uh, when he developed his own studio. And it's a wonderful story. Serenin, of course, was the first building, and you know, 15 years after the first building, the patrons of the Art Center said, well, it's time to add on. We, you know, it's not big enough. So they went to Serenin's office, and Serenin's office, I believe Serenin had died at that time, but his studio was still working, and his studio had no interest in, in building a new building. And so one of our patrons said, well, I've heard of this architect, I am Pei. Let's give him a call. And so from uh, the phone booth on the streets of New York, they called I am Pei, and I am Pei said, sure, come on up. And so I am Pei drew the design of the new building on a napkin, and it turned out to be this building. And the third building is Richard Meyer's building, which uh, very much in the Courboursier style, this very clean uh, building that has the, the center structure of concrete that is then uh, encased with a variety of organic and geometric shapes extending from it. But on the grounds of the Art Center, the Art Center is a private nonprofit. We're not connected with the city or university or any other entity, but we are on city property. Uh, we uh, don't own the land we are on, but our agreement with the city allows us to use it into perpetuity. And a part of that agreement is to allow us to put sculpture on the grounds, and we have done so surrounding the Art Center. And there are four major works on the grounds, and this is Richard Serra's Standing Stones. This were produced in the late 1980s, perhaps 1990. Bruce Nauman's Animal Pyramid, which you can see is just outside the uh, Richard Meyer building. We do also have a very large Andy Goldsworthy sculpture behind the Art Center, and further in the city park, there's a, a major landscape work by the artist Mary Miss. So this is, um, well, let me give you two other slides, too. But in the city of Des Moines proper in 1974, in the midst of urban development, we created a performing arts center downtown and a park in front of that performing arts center. 
And the city fathers planted a beautiful sculpture by Claus Oldenburg's Caruso's Umbrella. Meredith Corporation, which is a printing corporation that does traditional home and home and gardens and a variety uh, of other uh, magazines. This is Claus Oldenburg as well, a garden trial, which is, this is perhaps 20 feet, as you can imagine, with Claus Oldenburg's. So this would give you an idea of what the public art was in Des Moines before the Sculpture Park. Certainly there are other examples, many of them historic, uh, in relationship to the history of Iowa, such as on the, uh, the state capitol grounds and et cetera. But this would be the contemporary and the modern work that the city residents would have been familiar with, and of course, hopefully in relationship to the Art Center, they would have been familiar with contemporary art, but this is what the citizens would have viewed on a continuous basis. In fact, this piece is at the entrance of downtown, the Caruso's umbrella is in the center of downtown. And then in 2007, John, Papa John, uh, gave me a call. And Patricia, this is one of those great calls that you, you, know, you dream your, your life of getting. <coughs> and let me back up. John and Mary Papa John, um, they are both Greek. Uh, he was an immigrant to the United States. He and his family moved to Mason City, Iowa, which is in northern Iowa, where his father had a grocery store. And he, along with his brothers, worked in the grocery store. And they are certainly self-made. In fact, they all went to the University of Iowa, but they took turns. In other words, one brother would go one year, the other brothers would work, so that would allow the, the next brother to go the next year. So that would give you the, the background and the work ethic of which these uh, gentlemen, in particular John, uh, has experienced. So he's very much a self-made man. He's a venture capitalist, and he has bought and sold perhaps 100 primarily biochemical, <laughs> biotechnology corporations um, uh, during his uh, course of business. He's 85 years old, by the way. He goes to work seven days a week. Uh, he's probably in his office at six o'clock in the morning and probably works till six. Even on vacation, he's working. Uh, he, he has not stopped and he continues to do so. So that is the personality in which you're, you're dealing with. So he gives me a call and he says, Jeff, I have an idea. And of course, I have no idea what he's going to say. Um, he says, "Ah, John and Mary, you know, Mary and I want to give the Art Center our sculpture collection, and we want to put it in the Western Gateway of of Des Moines." And I said, "Well, John, that's just a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can make that happen." Um, the Western Gateway of Des Moines. This is Meredith Corporation, by the way. This is 15th Street, and this is 13th Street. This is Locust, which is the main avenue into the city from the airport. And this is Grand Avenue, which is another, as the name implies, a Grand Avenue of Des Moines. The interesting thing of the Western Gateway was it was completed in 2006. And remember, this phone call came in 2007. So the city had spent $26 million to buy this land and to tear down what was there to create an open space similar to a central park for Des Moines. And this idea of this central green space was developed in the 1990s by Mario Gonzalez, who was an urban planner, teaches at Princeton, and the city had hired him as a consultant to help develop downtown. What can downtown Des Moines become? And one of his ideas was to create this green space. And so they worked for 16 years, as you can imagine, city in terms of developing the, the revenue and the, the ability to take land and to create land and then to, to change it into an open space, as you see here. It, it took a very long process. And to have it changed a year later was an interesting proposition. Uh, but. So it was opened in 2006, and it was an absolute flat landscape. And there was a grid of sidewalks, and so it was a very sterile space. And everyone who comes into downtown Des Moines has to come down Locust Street. And so, of course, I was often there, and there was never anyone there. You know, this beautiful green open space, but there was never anyone there. And the city immediately jumped on the idea that this was an extraordinary thing to do. So there was uh, the 
the second phone call that John Papa John made was to a city councilwoman. Her name was Christine Hensley, and Christine Hensley immediately jumped on the idea as well. And so from that phone call in March of 2007 until September of 2009, uh, we raised the money, changed the landscape of the park, planted the sculpture, and opened the sculpture park. So uh, in just over two years from the idea of this, uh, it became uh, um, a concrete object and a concrete part of the city. And it, it truly was an extraordinary process to go through, uh, particularly working with the city, which um, realistically has many um, legal issues and, and many ideas that you have to deal with in terms of public land and placing something on public land, and the public-private partnerships that go along with, with such an endeavor. But I must say it was so extraordinary that the city of Des Moines immediately realized the possibilities that a sculpture park could bring to the city of Des Moines and the changes it could bring to the city and how it could change the aura, it could change the landscape, uh, change the character of a community, and I'm happy to say that's exactly what happened with this park. There were 31 funders for the park. The John and Mary Papajohn gave the Art Center all the sculptures, and it came uh, at first in, in 25 sculptures. And we don't want to talk about value, but we will. But it's, it's estimated at 40 to $50 million worth of sculpture given um, to the Art Center, which is certainly an extraordinary gift to the Art Center, but it's also an extraordinary gift to the city of Des Moines as this is free and open and accessible to everyone. So you have high quality work, by major modern and contemporary masters, and in many cases, extraordinary examples by those modern and contemporary masters that is available to everyone. So there, there are many facets uh, that we can certainly talk about this part, but let's, let's, uh, let's go back to the funders a bit. There were 31 funders. There were corporations, foundations, and individuals that agreed with the idea that this is something meaningful and changing for the community in a number of ways and wanted to be a part of it. And remember, this was, we were raising this money in 2008 and 2009, and we know exactly what happened at this time. So we raised $6.5 million in a very short period of time to transform the landscape that you see here. Remember, it was a flat, sterile landscape. And uh, to make it an inviting place for visitors, but also to create a site for sculpture. And as we go through the slides, when I, I show you examples of the work, you'll see that this is not, it, it is a city park and is meant to be used and utilized in that way, but is primarily and most paramount a sculpture park. And so you're not gonna have greenery, you're not gonna have trees, you'll have some. And of course it's grown, this is very early photograph. Um, so the landscape is not important. The architecture is not important. The sculpture is the most important part of this. And so even when we talk about the pedestals, the pedestals are minimal. When we talk about the labels, the labels aren't in front of the work. They're to the side because nothing can get in the way of that visual experience with the sculpture. <coughs> so that it was wonderful to be able to be a part of those aesthetic decisions and a part of how you lay out a park and I believe I was speaking with someone, we were very lucky for, it, we started out with 25 works of art, so we had a body of work to begin with to make an arrangement, uh, an organization of the park, and I'll give you a comparison. The Minneapolis Sculpture Park, which is an extraordinary sculpture park uh, that has a very similar arrangement with the Walker Art Center and the city of Minneapolis, they have, I think, 37-ish works in their park today, but their park is 25 years old. And so that has a different history than, than our park. And I'm not making comparisons, one is better than the other, I'm just saying that we had the, the, the good fortune to begin with a body of work so we can make those arrangements. So picture that this area was once uh, car showrooms, mechanic shops, uh, if you have visited Des Moines uh, prior to this, I think there were probably some adult bookstores and bars in this area. So it really wasn't the greatest entrance in, into the city of Des Moines. And even some of these, where this was a Cadillac showroom, um, and I believe that was as well. And, and so 
imagine the transformation of what this area was into what it is today. So we'll, we'll start you know, with those 25 works. I, I had this wonderful, you know, I'm like, okay, how do you place these works? How do you curate these works? How do you create spaces for these works? So what we did, oops, I'm sorry. What we did is create four burns, and you may not be able to tell very well here. There's a burn, there's a burn, there's a burn, there's a burn. And the idea was to mimic the rolling hills of Iowa and the prairie grasses of Iowa. And three of the burns have a concrete wall that creates a gallery or a space in which conversations between works of art can take place. And they also create these wonderful pathways and these wonderful vistas where you would come from an open space, you would be squeezed, and then you would open out into a, a, an, a larger open space. And so you constantly have these vistas as you walk into the park. And again, remember, you can walk into this park in every direction. But we see this as the entrance to the park. Right here would be the, the plaque, which is the, the plaque, the Papa John Sculpture Park, and the funders. And this I see as the entrance way to the park. And I'll go through each of these rooms for you. And by the way, if you have questions as we go, just shout them out. There, there's, there's no reason why we can't have a conversation. And so from east to west, it's very simple, and sometimes I think it's really too simple. This is realism. This is figurative abstraction. This is abstraction. And this is conceptual minimalist work. And then you'll have large pieces here and here and additional works that I call markers of the sites. And they're these large works that can't fit within one of these categories, but they're so massive both in size and in psychological impact that they hold a space only uh, to themselves. So let's go to the entrance here. Uh, these two, actually all three of the works are by the Swiss artist Ugo Rondononi, who's of an Italian heritage. And this placement is very purposeful. Remember, Grand Avenue is going here on the side, and it is going from east to west. So as you drive by the park, this is what you see. And I wanted these pieces in particular to be at the entryway to the park because, as you will see, there's some difficult work here. Uh, difficult in the sense that it is conceptually based or it's minimalist work, um, and not everyone shares that aesthetic. But this work is kind of fun. It has a cartoon quality to it, uh, and it is engaging. So it, it could be uh, appreciated and engaged by a large number of people. Um, they're called Moonrise, and they refer to the faces of the moon, or the, the man in the moon with the face in the moon. So here you have uh, January, and here you have August. This one's a rather sinister looking one, but this one is peering off to the side, uh, and he has a rather uh, silly, humorous face. And it was very purposeful that I wanted the entryway to this park to have a bit of humor and have a, a bit of accessibility. This piece, also by Ugo Rondononi, um, it's very similar in a way to the others, perhaps not visually, but in concept. And it's also important as you enter the park that you ask those questions of why we do what we do, why artists do what they, we do or they do. Um, this, this piece is called Air Gets Into Everything, Even Nothing. And it is a cast of a 2,000-year-old olive tree in Italy that's still living. So it's made of aluminum, it is painted white, but it's coming from a, a very much a, a living organism. These refer to the man and the moon, and the moon itself, throughout a large part of humankind, has held any number of references, uh, be they goddesses, be they uh, you know, determining when you plant, uh, when you harvest, uh, uh, religious uh, schedules, et cetera, et cetera. The list could go on and on in terms of references to the moon and what it means to mankind. But when you look at the 2,000-year-old olive tree, particularly from Italy, which is one of the centers of Western thought, Greece and Rome particularly, you, you get these larger questions of asking where does culture come from, where do 
how do you change culture? How do you create culture? Asking those very large questions that the general public may not know that that's what we're asking when we're talking about the sculpture park. But this is a perfect, to me, entry into the sculpture park, asking those very questions of why this sculpture park exists in the first place, because it asks those big questions. And so, and forgive me, these were even in process, but I, I told you the first room, which has five or six works, deals with realism in some kind. So you have Anthony Caro here, and Judith Shea, and then you have Louise Bourgeois Spider, two horses by uh, Deborah Butterfield and Barry Flanagan. The Louise Spider is perhaps one of the most significant works in the park. Uh, Louise Bourgeois died perhaps two years ago. I believe she was at the age of 99. Uh, it's also important to note that there's a, both uh, masculine and feminine voices in the park, modern and contemporary voices, as well as of different nationalities. But her work, uh, and I always stop when I give tours of the park and talk about her work because it is so potent and so important, and then it goes back to those general questions when we talked about Ugo Rondononi uh, and his questions and his look at the, the, the culture of mankind. Well, Louise Bourgeois does both. She looks at her own personal history as, as well as these larger questions. She, the use of the spider in her work is a recurring theme. It's a very important theme for her, and it refers to her mother. The artist's mother died when the artist was 21, and she had a wonderful relationship with her mother. And she has uh, looked at the attributes that she found both in the spider and the mother is the same. Um, which I don't know about in your house, but in my house, when you see a spider, it's not necessarily a positive thing for my daughters and my wife. Um, so it, 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 it adds a, a potency to that question and that discussion and the knowledge that she equates the spider with her mother, I think is a very important one. But think about those attributes that she found both in her spider and in her mother. Um, she's extremely protective, she's industrious, she's hardworking. It's also important to note that her families worked with tapestries and were tapestry restorers and the notion that a spider is a weaver um, goes back to that personal experience. So you have the personal narrative of the feminine voice coming from Louise Bourgeois, but in this very powerful, powerful way uh, presenting the, 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 her own personal story in relationship to the larger uh, culture. This piece was commissioned specifically for the park by John and Mary Papa John, and it was the largest work that Deborah Butterfield has ever created. The Papa John's request was to create a Trojan horse for the sculpture park, and Deborah Butterfield said, no, I'm not going to create a, a, a Trojan horse for you, but I'll create a big horse for you. And um, this is entitled Ancient Forest, and, and this work uh, was added to uh, the work Juno you know here. It's also important to note that 14 of these sculptures were in the front yard and backyard of John and Mary Pop John within Des Moines. So you could ride down you know, Forest Drive in Des Moines and see the huge marked Suvaro in their front yard, which was, became a tourist destination in and of itself. Uh, and, and so it was wonderful. Uh, as they thought, but now the entire community can in enjoy the work uh, that way. So we, we came from the entryway, we went to realism in a variety of forms, whether it's figurative or a spider, and then we're looking at figurative abstraction. And by that I mean it does reference the figure, but it's more abstract than what we've seen before. Even Ellsworth Kelly's totem here is certainly a very minimalist approach to making art, but all of his art refers to something beyond itself, whether it was a simple leaf, whether it's a simple twig, or even the space between leaves within a tree. I think Joe Shapiro's work is perhaps the best example of this figurative abstraction where you see uh, this is obviously a very simplified form, but you can readily tell a torso, two legs, and two arms within uh, this very uh, gestural moment. And the two Gary Hume works are called Back of the Snowmen. The Papa John's already had the white snowman, but they commissioned Gary Hume to create a black snowman. They wanted diversity illustrated in the park and thus the two snowmen, one black and one white, uh, were placed in the park. And they're called the back of the snowman because, 
as you walk all the way around the snowman, you never arrive at the front. There's never the, the buttons or, or the carrot nose. So it's very much an abstracted form that, that references uh, a figure. There uh, is a more perfect example of those two. And then in the center of the park, you have a, a beautiful piece by Scott Burton. And, and Scott Burton would produce works certainly in the 70s, 80s. I believe he died in the late 80s. And he was a revolutionary artist at the time. And I think it's hard for us to grasp just how revolutionary he was. Here you see very beautiful objects, but obviously they're functional. They're meant to, be, you're meant to sit on these granite chairs and to utilize this granite table. And that very fact that you use public art was something very extraordinary at the time when he produced it. So usually you, you might see a sculpture on a pedestal or you might see an equestrian figure, certainly in historic times. So the notion that public art can be engaged with can be utilized and can have a particular function uh, was certainly something that Scott Burton brought to the table and it's certainly something that we bring to the sculpture park as well. And then we've, we come to the abstract room and when I, I know these are very simplified ways of doing it but it is a way to have a conversation and for these works to have a conversation with one another. Another most significant work in the park would be Willem de Kooning uh, this is Tony Craig and this is Bill Tucker. Willem de Kooning um, produced just 26 sculptures in his lifetime. There were perhaps uh, certainly addition works, but 26 uh, particular sculptures. And this sculpture was created first with, with balls of clay, tiny balls of clay, when you can actually uh, see the fingerprints of the artist. And the British sculptor Henry Moore actually encouraged Willem de Kooning to make these sculptures larger and to create them in bronze, uh, which is the example here. So uh, Louise Bourgeois and Willem de Kooning certainly are two of the most significant works in the park. And, and each of these certainly refer back to nature or refer back to perhaps uh, form, but in a highly stylized or highly abstract way. Uh, William Tucker, for example, is called Gymnast Two, and with that sliver of information, you can see that perhaps he was referring to the crick of an elbow or the, or the turn of the knee or even the turn of a torso that you might see in a, in a gymnast. And the Tony Craig work here is called Order, and with a sliver of information that Tony Craig used to work in a science lab. He was a lab technician. And the fact that these are enlarged trilobites, which were marine fossils, that he's now enlarged and they're becoming a, a hybrid with perhaps test tubes and or beakers that one might find in a studio. But also the notion of order, the notion of how man has classified the natural world through genus and species and families and orders. Uh, again, how we are ordering, how we are providing structure to the world around us is, is certainly a part of that. So, from entryway, figuration, abstract, uh, figurative abstraction and abstraction, we move to something a bit more difficult as I talked about. These are two Tony Smith's work that were produced in the 1960s and Tony Smith began his career as an architect. And in fact, he would make as many architects do. I believe there's some architects here. You would make models out of uh, either wood or cardboard. And Tony Smith was recuperating from uh, an injury, in fact, in his uh, uh, hospital bed. And he was making these models, which again were then other artists encouraged him to make these on a very large scale, of which you see here. And the notion of architecture is very apparent here when you see the post and lintel uh, of this work, which again invites the viewer to become a part of the sculpture and to, to walk through the sculpture but they're very minimalist forms and they're very uh, austere color and they're very singular color and or lack of color certainly pushes them to the minimalist arena. And then carrying that idea even further is the notion of Saul Lewitt, which is very much a conceptual piece and this is, uh, is an untitled work. And here we see a, a stack of figures, a grid, 
And the notion that this grid can extend in either direction is a, a part of this work. So it is simply just a sliver of an idea, uh, an illustration of a sliver of a, an order of a system, uh, again, of how we order the space around us and, and how uh, we might see the world. This, Mark de Suvero, is entitled T8, and we placed it as the first work that you will see when you come into the city of Des Moines and we thought this would be the signature work for the sculpture park, and we wanted it to be this burst of energy, this burst of brilliant orange-red color uh, to signify the sculpture park and to signify the energy of the city. But we were quickly told differently by the public, <laughs> which is really exciting. So you can see this, you would come down here and this was here, and this was placed in the center of the park. This is Nomad by the Spanish artist Yomo Plenza. And it is 27 feet high, and it is a crouching figure. You can see that this, uh, actually a small boy is holding his knees to his chest. And the center is opened up, inviting the viewer to enter the sculpture. The skin of the figure is made of letters, Roman letters. He's made many of these figures that might include uh, a variety of languages, some that have a variety within the same works. This one has to be, uh, happen to be Roman letters, and there's not a word hidden there, at least that I can find. In other words, you can't find love on the side or, or, or something like that. So it is the idea of communication. It is the idea of transmitting ideas which this work is talking about, which goes perfectly back to Ugo Rondononi's um, idea of asking those large questions of how do you create culture, how do you change culture, how do you disseminate culture, and, and this is doing it. So what I was saying is we, we thought this would be the signature work, the city decided this would be the signature work, and by the city I mean the public. Uh, this quickly became where weddings take place, where every senior portrait in Des Moines is taken here. <laughs> and, <coughs> uh, and in the beautiful mound of dirt, which is the highest mound here in the park, has become a, a favorite site to sit and, and to over, uh, have an overview of the park and look at this work. This work has since become photographed and it's on the copy of every phone book, every book of list in Des Moines, every partnership list. So it has become an iconic image for the city, which is very exciting for us as well. And then we, we uh, have these two that, that have a, um, uh, an area to themselves. This is Martin Perrier's work entitled uh, Decoy, and this is a five-paneled um, uh, work by Richard Serra, which is Corten Steele. You're familiar with his work, I'm sure. And this seemingly has these very, very heavy paintings that seem to be precariously leaning up one against the other, like a house of cards. When you were playing cards and you build a house of cards, it, uh, a single burst of wind would blow them over, which, which of course is not the case, but that psychological feeling of the weight of this material is a part of the work. So those works that I just showed you was the beginning of the park, and we have since added three works to the park, and each addition has been very purposeful in terms of what we would like to add to the park. You've seen work produced in the 60s, uh, as well as up into the present, but we also, there's not much color too, and I know we don't talk about color, but, but the notion of adding vitality and energy to the park was very apparent for us because we wanted to make it a, a place that is alive and engaging. And adding Keith Haring's three dancing figures was just a, a part of that. And then adding a very recent work, Yoshitomo Nara's White Ghost, uh, was uh, the second addition to the park, and I'd see it also as a, a marker of the site, and it holds down the northwest corner of the park. Uh, it is about 12 to 14 feet high, and if you're familiar with Nara's work, he's obviously Japanese, and he's coming from that, that generation of manga and animation where it has become very much a part of the visual culture of Japan and since it has certainly ricocheted around the world. Uh, my 
I have a daughter who has always loved manga and always learned, uh, loved Japanese animation so much so that she's studied Japanese and, and now speaks Japanese. So this, this is, this is uh, certainly a part of youth culture <coughs> and we wanted to, to bring a part of that to the park. The latest addition to the park is something that I am extremely proud of and in fact it hasn't even had its official opening yet. Uh, we finished it in November of just last year and the ground has was quickly frozen and we couldn't even finish the landscape around it. This is Olafur Eliasson's work. It's called Panoramic Awareness Pavilion, which is a very grand title, which I probably wouldn't have titled it that, but um, it's 13 feet high, it's 30 feet in diameter, and the center, it has 23 glass panels. Uh, Olafur Eliasson is a Danish artist. His parents are Icelandic and he has a studio in Berlin. And he's done major projects all over the world. He did a, a major installation, for example, entitled Weather at Tate Modern, where he has transformed, if you've been to Tate Modern, the huge turbine hall, using those materials or those elements of the world around us in which we use to experience the world around us. In other words, light, color, air, water, fire. He did a project called New York City Waterfalls where he literally created waterfalls on the East River. An extraordinary, extraordinary project. And we had always wanted Oliver Eliasson for the park from the very first. And so this was a commission for the park. And I must say that we were very pleased that Oliver did not hesitate for a minute to agree to this commission and to produce a work specifically for the sculpture park. <coughs> and he's the only artist who's also gotten it too. I talked about early on that we, we wanted the, the sculpture park to be like uh, waves on the Iowa prairie and the rolling hills of Iowa. And he said, I see the sculpture park as an ocean with waves. And I want this piece to be like a lighthouse, like a beacon, where the light can serve as a guidance and a navigational tool for the visitor through the park. This is very beautiful, it's very poetic, it's very simple, but it's so beautiful in that simplicity. So in the daytime, you have this beautiful pavilion of colored glass, which you can enter, and at night, the light will turn on, so it glows. So you have this glowing circle of light at night, so indeed it is a beacon as you go through the park. And this is, a, I'm perhaps not pronouncing it correctly, a Freshnel lantern, which is the, the lens that is used in lighthouses, literally. So what you have here is similar to the lens of a lighthouse. It has, it has one simple light bulb in it that it then is refracted and expanded by the lens. But it also becomes, and, and I don't want to diminish it in any way, but it becomes something of a fun house uh, when you walk into because it distorts your perception of the world around you. You may see a figure here but that figure in reality is way over here. So it, it does indeed uh, distort your experience, but it creates an experiential experience. Uh, it creates an experience for you. You have to participate. You have to, to use your senses and use those elements that we talked about, such as light, such as color, to, to have this experience. And, and I think that adds a dimension to the park that perhaps was not there before. Again, we keep trying to to curate and to change the park and enliven the park to make it not only showcase qualitative artists, not only showcase uh, excellent examples by those artists, but to have that experience that is transformative, that we can answer those questions that Ugo Rondononi started for us as we entered this experience in the park. And is that a rotating beacon? It is not. It simply glows. So it is, it is just... Uh, uh, again, this quiet simplicity that is a part of this work. So I'm as excited to say this is 2014, so we're in our fifth year of the Sculpture Park. And our idea, our hope, our dream, 
that contemporary and modern art placed within the public sphere could transform a community, I think is taking place. We talked about the, the, the park area that I was talking about that the city was desperately trying to, to use in its urban planning and its urban development. It's called the Western Gateway as opposed to the Eastern Gateway. And I'm happy to say that every single building surrounding the park has now, well, there's been either new buildings built around it or every single building has been renovated or is in the process of being renovated. So it is indeed not only changing the cultural landscape of the community, but it's changing the economic landscape of the community. Um, this doesn't even to bring into question the notion of cultural tourism or the notion of um, visitors coming to town and this being the catalyst for those visitors where they will then spend money in restaurants, spend nights, shop in shopping malls, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, it, it's exciting to participate in the city in that way. And this also doesn't mean that our corporations, Des Moines is an insurance town, so there, I think there's 600 insurance companies in town. So perhaps just as Wichita, Des Moines, needs to bring in brilliant, excellent people from outside its community to be a part of its workforce. They're not coming to Des Moines, they won't come to Wichita if you don't have a quality of life in which they would want to come. And so those corporate, yes, it's true, it's true. Um, so the principles, the nationwide, the allies, the, the, you know, on and on and on, they use the cultural organizations of the Des Moines community, they use the Sculpture Park to present to the outside world that this is a qualitative place to be. And that's what I'm talking about when I say it changes the aura and character of the city. And I think it's done that in very tangible ways. This is the park at night with the, the background of the city. Not at night in snow, I mean. Uh, for example, just as Wichita, and this is my first time at Wichita, so if I get the facts wrong, uh, I apologize, but I, there's a river through your city, just as there's a couple of rivers through Des Moines, and the, the city, with the help of principal and numerous other funders, is creating a river walk uh, along that river. There's a mile on one side and a mile of the, on the other, created by two bridges, and there's a variety of infrastructures that uh, is being developed there. And public art is a part of that infrastructure. And I just want to point out, there's a major piece here, a major piece here, a major piece by Juno, Jun Kaneka was installed here, and then another piece here. So just as the Western Gateway in Des Moines in 2006 was a sterile, quiet, unused space and the placement and the addition of art has enlivened that. This park is filled with people all the time. That's going to do the same for the Principal River Walk. And this is an example of the work that the Art Center happens to own as well. Another Joel Shapiro that's in front of City Hall and the river is right here and the River Walk comes here. So again the notion of public art is something the City of Des Moines now sees as a catalyst for great change in a variety of directions. So much so, you saw the Caruso's umbrella, and that was a part of a park area in front of the Civic Center, and that was produced and created in 1974. So now it's time to redo that park. They're not taking away the, the Oldenburg because it had become a city icon as well, but they're redoing the park and they know they can't redo the park without adding public art to it. And this is the work that they'll be adding, which is now going to be called Coles Commons. And this is a work by um, Jim Campbell. He's based in uh, Berkeley. And it will be a cloud of floating light. So again, the notion that public art can enliven a space and create a destination space and a center of activity and a center of change, um, the city gets it. And this is a, a prime example, and I can't wait to see. This will be installed I probably this fall. And so when you come back to Des Moines uh, next year, you'll see another example of how public art is changing the community. So. 
I'm, I'm terribly excited and proud that the Art Center and my little portion of it, you know, we, we always say, in, and I tell my staff, you know, well, what do you want to do? You know, what does the Art Center want to do? And I, and I say, I want to change the world. And, you know, that sounds really grand, and, and it is. But if I can change Des Moines, and I think we have, and if we continue to change Des Moines, then we're on our way. So that's why I encourage you. You have this great opportunity to change the world. So you should do it. <laughs> If there are any questions, yes. With all due respect to the attractiveness of your art environment, what else has been the magnet for 640 insurance companies to come to Des Moines? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I, I can answer that with, with great authority. I'm sure there are regulation, lack of regulations, tax incentives, economic incentives, with, without a doubt. Hopefully it is also, just as Wichita, just as Kansas, that there's a character of the people, there's a work ethic um, uh, that benefits that type of business. So I don't think there's one answer to that question, but I'm hoping, but, but I can even go back further. Um, and again, I don't know enough about Wichita to answer this question, but in my experience in Des Moines, it takes just a few people with great vision, just a few individuals that can say, no, it has to be better. It has to be excellent. You have to do the best. And I'm not sure that answers your question, but it creates an expectation of quality and expectation in a community that permeates everything that happens. And I will use the Art Center as an example. For, for example, those three architects we could have easily taken, and there's nothing wrong with local architects, but we could have easily taken a local architect, Joe Blow, and have him design the buildings, but that wasn't good enough. We had to participate on a global level at a high quality. And I think, the, and in our collecting philosophy at the Art Center, we have to collect the very best. We have to have the best artist, and we have the best work by that artist. We don't always do that, but at least that's a philosophy, and that's a, a um, a mindset that I think permeates the community as well. So when you are creating those companies, when you are creating um, the World Food Prize, which is in Des Moines, you have to do the. You have to be excellent. You have to be qualitative, and you have to participate on a global level. I don't know if that answers your question, but at least that's what I envision the mindset of Des Moines to be, which perhaps creates a mindset where business can flourish and grow. Very good questions. The, the park is open for everyone. It supposedly closes at 12, and during the summer there are police um, that, that monitor that. The park is ringed by 12 cameras. Every work of art is watched 24-7. Nationwide Corporation, which is just down the block, their security mechanisms monitor the sculpture park. I'm not, vandalism has occurred. Knock on wood, it hasn't been disastrous. Um, but yes, the potential is absolutely there for it to happen. But my hope is also, since it is in a very public space, that the community protects it as well. I'm not saying that's very successful. But um, it's also very visible. So if someone is, you know, perhaps someone will, will have an eye out. Oh yes, absolutely. So Always lit. Seven, it's yes, the it's yes, yes. Um, pe people, people love to climb on the Jamal Plaza, the white sculpture. Just love it, and you know, just drives crazy. Um, um, so you know, there's work to be done. If there's a special event like the arts festival downtown or or a, a music festival, I'll have guards out there that will roam it during that time just because I see that as a sensitive time where thousands of people will be roaming the park. So security lining guards is definitely an ongoing expense. Yes. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. But in talking here with, with other folks, the, the, the garden that you were referring to is connected, in a sense, to your facility, which I think will very, go a very long way in terms of managing some of those security issues. Start spending quite a bit of cost. Uh, 6.5 million, no. which includes some endowments for the city has an endowment and the art center has an endowment to maintain, uh, the Art Center's endowment is to maintain the sculptures, the city endowment is to maintain the, uh, the landscape. What, what are the provisions to preserve and maintain the outdoor sculpture? We, the Art Center, owns and maintains the, the sculpture. So we use um, our own staff. Uh, we do maintenance work in the spring and maintenance work in the winter, whether it would be um, general cleaning, repainting, uh, hot waxing for bronze sculptures. Uh, it is an ongoing process. White ghosts, the, the white figure, Yoshitomo Naro, that actually is, uh, it has to be sent to, it's in the process of being sent to New York for some conservation work. So just as there's conservation, ongoing conservation work in the museum building and and museum proper, there will be ongoing museum calls for the Sculpture Park, too. Yeah. How is the museum now dealing with the relationship with the designer of the park? You said before that you've been involved in a few. How is it selected? Is there an architect in the off in the audience? There is. Oh, they're not raising their hand though. <laughs> um, Mario Gonzalez was a part of the original design for the Western Gateway, which was that green space, that Central Park idea, and so it, it was. And he was a continual, a continuous consultant for the city as well. So it was an easy fit to move him into this notion of designing the sculpture park because he had designed the park to begin with. So he was just continuing his work. Um, sometimes working with architects, or at least who, architects who have a, have a great ego, um, can be an interesting experience. Um, I'm not sure we're friends anymore, but um, I, I must say, though, that they gave me great leeway. Um, they never told me where to put a sculpture. N never. So I laid out the work. I helped create the rooms and the vistas. Uh, as you can imagine, with any city project, you bring in zoning people, you bring in parks people. Uh, but all of that was rather fluid and, and very easy. Um, so the, the, perhaps the, um, the challenges came when the, the notion of recognition was involved. But, <laughs> um, but I, I must say I was given pretty much free hand. So I, I placed every sculpture. I determined where it was, and, and it was never corrected uh, by the architect or designer. Yes? Um, shall I tell you a story? <laughs> how do I? How did I get the corporations to to buy into this? Well, the general the general discussion or the general or quick answer would be, it was in their neighborhood, and they wanted a qualitative <coughs> neighborhood. But to, to give you an example, perhaps of the mindset that I uh, was, was talking about earlier. Uh, when we were going toward this $24 million campaign, it had nothing to do with the sculpture park per se, what the Art Center was asking corporations, asking individuals, you know, can you help us do all of these projects? And we went to this CEO, it happened to be of a grocery store chain, and um, I, I learned later that this CEO had been an artist or wanted to be an artist. But we were talking with him, and he was a rather gruff, gruff guy, and, um, you know, he, he was, kind enough to, to give us an, an audience, but he, he slammed his fist on the table and he said, the art center is just like a sewage system. 
And I said, oh, God, I guess this isn't going very well. And uh, he says, the city can't live without it. So that's why. <laughs> Yes. Yes, the, the, the river divides Des Moines, and then you go east, starting with First Street, going east, and the capital would be on each 6th Street. And then going west, the Sculpture Park is on 13th and 15th Street, and the Arts Center proper is on 47th Street, going west. So that's the... It, it would be both, to, to be honest. But in terms of it expanding, um, it, it's even been described as this Locust Grand Avenue um, uh, length uh, as a string of pearls, mm -hmm. where you would have these beautiful stops along the way of, of Grand and Locust, where public art would be those pearls along Grand and Locus. So perhaps not the sculpture park itself would expand or not the art center itself, but the, the community's involvement with public art would expand along the way, and indeed that's happening. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, my question is, as you move forward to make acquisitions, what guides you? Um, you're very specific in your area, your room. Is it something you feel is missing in a room? Is it something, an artist, a sculptor that you just would like to have? It, it's, it's a little bit of all of that. Certainly with Olafur Elias, and this was an artist we had to have. Uh, he's one of the most important artists working today, and he was creating that ex that that experience of of experiencing a work of art. I'm sorry, I'm not articulating it that way. So that's something was that we we definitely wanted. But any time you would add work to a collection, whether it's a museum collection or the sculptural collection, you go through a variety of of, of um, processes or thought processes. To answer your question directly, it's very subjective and it's very intuitive. Um, when I add work to the collection of the Art Center, you certainly want uh, an artist who is contributing to the cultural record, who's making an impact on what is happening today. And I'm speaking specifically here about contemporary art because that's our focus. Um, and, and then you want a work that exemplifies that artist to the, to the best way, you know, that most significant work, that seminal work that would describe and exemplify that artist's work of art. So they're, they're those very logistical uh, art history, cultural record based um, thought processes, but it really all goes down to subjective thinking. You don't want to say it's work because I like it, but it's work because you like it. Um, to be honest, but you're bringing in all of those other things that inform, hopefully, your interest and or like in that particular work of art. Are there others? Yes. Uh, Metro, 500,000, probably 560 now, something like that. I'm sorry? Uh -huh. 
Wonderful. Well, well, I invite you to come. I, I hope you do. I'll, I'll give you a tour. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, do you have a question? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I, I wish I did, but Des Moines does, I think, I think this is correct, per capita it has the largest influx of uh, workers into its downtown core than any other city in the United States. I think about 80,000 people a day come to work in the downtown core. So obviously that's helped. Yes, yes. There has been, and I, forgive me, I can't give you the exact numbers, but it is in the billions of dollars in terms of capital um, uh, or, or building or renovation projects in downtown Des Moines in, in the last years. Um, so it is, it's an enormous uh, push, interest, uh, contribution to the downtown core, which, which is not negating the fact, D Des Moines is, and if, again, forgive me, I don't know the geography of, of Wichita, but Des Moines is, is considered a square and it is surrounded by satellite cities. So Des Moines proper can't grow physically, it can grow up but not out. And the um, satellite cities are absolutely booming with double digit growth. Um, so it is not just the core that's growing, but um, the, the satellite cities are, are doing that as well. And our um, Chamber of Commerce, for lack of a better word, is it's a metro-wide, not city-based. So all of those 11, 12, 15 municipalities uh, join together in one concerted effort to promote the metro as a, as a, and or in addition to promoting themselves, they promote the region because we believe we will be much more effective and much more successful if we promote the region as a unit as opposed to each individual. Uh, entity. So I don't even know where the, the divisions are between all those satellite cities from West Des Moines, Clive, Urbandale, Ankeny, Johnson. They, they, they all merge into one. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, Jeff, I wasn't willing to tell you this before I invited you, but um, we in the Midwest, you know this, and we in Wichita, we tend to fall in love <laughs> with our speakers. So um, apparently, um, you know, set the table, we're on our way. I happen to know that it's a professional acquirement of art museum directors that you have uh, the red carpet to roll out. It's really just a matter of how plush that carpet is. So, you know, you better go home and find it and Put our, put our name on it because apparently we're coming. And, and with that, we are officially kicked off for the year. Um, and we'll be back here again, I think it's April 18th, I forget the date, although you will, you will shortly receive a reminder from me in the mail. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. <laughs>